I, I want to start out, I know my time is limited, but I want to start out by reading a, a very brief uh, well, a few lines of poetry that I found this morning that seem to reflect my immense gratitude at the opportunity of being here and, and meeting the people I've met since I started this research. Uh, my bounty is as endless as the sea. My love is deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. That's William Shakespeare. Um, yes, I can speak up. So I want to express how profoundly uh, thankful I am and joyful at having the opportunity to not only be here, but to have participated in this research for the last three years. Uh, and in part because I think that getting these results is important to show the efficacy of Ibogaine for addiction treatment, and that's going to be important moving forward. Uh, but also, maybe even more importantly, because of the people I've met since I started doing this research, uh, who have shown me uh, such uh, generosity, support, and love uh, over, these, over these months and years. And some of those people are here today, and some of those people I just met this weekend. So um, I am going to be showing you a lot of numbers today. But I don't want, even though I think the numbers are important, I don't want the numbers to overshadow or obliterate the fact that people have told me how profound the experiences, experiences they've had are with Ibogaine and also uh, how, how uh, horrible they, people, people are when they arrive at these clinics. Oftentimes they're suicidal. Uh, they feel that if the, if the opiates don't kill them, they'll kill themselves. And if they can't find some kind of effective treatment, then they will just check out permanently. So these experiences are profoundly transformative, and I don't want to lose track of that during this, during this talk. So the study I'm describing today is an observational study of outcomes for people who are seeking IBM treatment for opiate addiction at clinics in Baja, California, Mexico. Um, and um, it's, um, I'm going to be showing you some preliminary results today, and I'm very happy to be able to do that today. Let's see. Clicker, there it goes. So. I'll be talking about Iboga, and sometimes people talk, talk about Ibogaine as Ibogaine powder. So just to be clear, we are not talking about a compound that has a similar name, Iocane powder, which is a tasteless, odorless powder that dissolves instantly in liquid and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. That talk is actually in room number nine uh, across the street, uh, on the other side of the street, that is. And uh, so if you want to leave for that talk now, you can do that. Uh, I'm also not talking about the, uh, the introduction of Ibogaine into popular culture, uh, which was in 1972 when Hunter S. Thompson revealed uh, presidential candidate Ed Edwin Muskie's uh, chronic Ibogaine use and ruined his presidential campaign. No, I'm going to be talking about a Ibogaine as is, it is used in addiction treatment. And Ibogaine, in case you don't know, is derived from a West African shrub, the aboga shrub, among other uh, plant sources. Uh, so the question we're looking at in this research study is, can Ibogaine facilitate long-term recovery from addiction? Um, you may be wondering, if, you have, if you're new to this topic, why would we even consider Ibogaine for addiction treatment? And I'm going to very quickly do an overview of the history of this. Uh, in 1962, Howard Lotsoff, 19 years old, uh, took Ibogaine for the first time and discovered serendipitously that it could rid him of his cravings for heroin and, uh, and also do that without uh, attendant uh, withdrawal symptoms that usually accompany heroin. And those are very famously uh, heinous withdrawal symptoms. Uh, he made it his life's work to uh, make Ibogaine treatment more widely available globally. And um, many people have worked to uh, create clinics for Ibogaine treatment around the world, uh, such that by 2006, over 3,400 people have been treated with Ibogaine. And since that time, I would, think, I would guess that that number has doubled because the, more and more people are being treated and the numbers are increasing more and more rapidly. Um, and so animal studies have shown that uh, Ibogaine greatly reduces the withdrawal symptoms uh, uh, for animals and also uh, cravings for, uh, that animals get when they are taken off of uh, opiates. Um, and there are very few clinical studies because I began as a Schedule I substance, uh, but the few of them that ha do exist uh, show that there is a resolution of withdrawal symptoms over the few days and weeks following treatment. 
and also is a, there's a significant reduction in drug cravings and in depression symptoms in uh, one month follow-up. Okay, so what's still needed is uh, a study that's going to confirm that the withdrawal symptoms are, are strongly attenuated uh, with either gain treatment and also maybe ease depression symptoms. And at the same time, a study that looks at the uh, at drug usage and quality of life following ibogaine treatment in the months thereafter, because there's very little documentation of what, and, and published evidence of what happens with people after the first month of post-treatment. So here comes the MAPS ibogaine study. And this uh, study was just completed in September of last year. The primary ob objective is to determine the eff efficacy of ibogaine-assisted therapy in producing extended periods of opiate drug use abstinence, reducing opiate drug use, and improving associated impacts of these behaviors as measured by the Addiction Severity Index Light, lovingly known as ASI Light, composite scores over a period of 12 months following therapy. Uh, here is a picture of one page of the ASI Light. Um, what the ASI does is it's an interview, a structured interview, where um, I ask the patients about their drug use and uh, related problem areas over a, over the past 30 days and also lifetime. So we're measuring the previous 30 days prior to the interview and also lifetime uh, in, in these different problem areas. You see medical status, employment status, drug and alcohol use, legal, family, social uh, relationships, and also psychiatric or psychological status. So uh, secondary objectives include looking at the ASI scores and seeing if they correlate with the subjective intensity of the uh, IBN experience as measured by the States of Consciousness questionnaire, which I'll explain in a bit, and also using the SOWS uh, so, uh, to see if Ibogaine uh, treatment reduces withdrawal symptoms. And so the SCQ, as I'll call it for brevity, um, it contains 100 items, 43 of which are derived from the Panky Richards Mystical Experiences Scale. Uh, this is also the same questionnaire that uh, uh, Griffiths and company at Johns Hopkins have used in their psilocybin studies. Uh, the other 57 questions uh, uh, that are in there are derived from uh, uh, some work that Stan Groff did in the 1970s. Uh, and just to give you an example of what the questions are like, under the mystical categories, uh, loss of your usual sense of time, experience of amazement, uh, non-mystical, uh, convincing feelings of contact with people who have died, feelings of grief, or increased awareness of the importance of interpersonal relationships. And we're studying the, the mystical experiences scales with these, and I think we're also going to look at the numbers for the non-mystical experiences, because some of these, as if any of you are familiar, and I know that some of you are familiar with the type of experiences people have with Ibogaine, you'll see that some of these non-mystical experiences are probably also uh, quite relevant for, for Ibogaine. So we're going to be looking at all of it. And uh, so the domains of mystical experience, if you've read William James or if you're familiar with the Griffith studies, you'll see these will be familiar to you. Uh, and to qualify as a mystical experience, uh, each domain has to have a score of 0.6 or higher. And the, the, the number 0.6, it's, the, uh, the score is from 0 to 1, and that represents a proportion of the actual score in the test to the maximum possible score in the test. And the uh, person who's doing the, uh, the questionnaire rates on a scale of 0 to 5 how intensely they've experienced those different things. So 0 being not at all, up to 5 being the strongest they've ever experienced it in their life. Um, okay, and, and SOWS, it's administered once before treatment, one, once after treatment. This is actually from one of the patients in the study. Um, before treatment, and they, they rate on a zero to four scale with intensity of their withdrawal symptoms. And then two or three days after the treatment, they do that again. And you can see this person's scores were much lower down in the zeros, and there's only one that's, that's marked at all. Um, and so we're comparing baseline before treatment to post-treatment. And uh, most people are familiar with the, the fact that heroin and uh, other opiate withdrawal is really heinous. Um, to give a really quick uh, overview of some examples of what happens two or three days after uh, you start going into withdrawal, uh, diarrhea, tired, unwell, extreme sweating, curled in fetal position, hot, cold sweats, no appetite, stomach cramps, snotty, watery eyes, everything hurts, bones, joints, muscles, cramps, can't eat, hold, cot, cot hold sweats. So if we can reduce those withdrawal symptoms significantly, that makes it a lot easier for people to detox. Yes, yes, thank you. So the study design, 
is that we've enrolled 30 people in the study and we're administering the ASI at baseline and then following up monthly for 12 months. Um, and we're also doing secondary measures including SOWs and the States of Consciousness questionnaire and a brief description of what their experience is before or uh, during the Abigain experience. Um, okay, and the uh, initial enrollment interview is done in person at the clinic or by video Skype and follow-ups by telephone. Current status is that we've we finished the study, so we had 30 people enroll out of 67 people who showed up at either of the two clinics in the study during the enrollment period. Um, this I'll show you, let's see, I should go. This uh, shows you that in the blue here of the large chunk of the pie of the people we enrolled, the other people were not eligible or declined to participate for various reasons. Um, we also have, um, so we followed, finished the follow-up in September 2012, and now we're entering and analyzing the data. So uh, preliminary results. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of safety, this is a very important number for us. Of all 67 people who were in the, at the clinics and treated during that enrollment period, there were no adverse events, which is very, very important, especially in ibogaine research. As you know, if you may know, uh, that there have been occasional deaths with ibogaine treatment for, for addiction. So um, the st uh, states of consciousness questionnaire preliminary results, what we're showing is a bimodal distribution. And what we have here is um, on the vertical axis, number of subjects who, who had that number of, uh, of domains with 0.6 or higher in the mystical experiences criterion uh, in, the, in the seven different domains of mystical experiences. And you'll see that out of those 28, only four, one seventh, um, qualified as mystical experiences, but there was a wide range. There's this kind of bimodal distribution, if you will, where um, a lot of people are down at zero and one, and a lot of people are up at six and seven. And what we'd like to do is to compare these two groups, maybe the top, the most intense experiencers versus the least intense experiencers, and look at that, how that correlates with their ASI scores. And there are also other types of correlations we can do with the SEQ. Yes. Oh, uh, let me explain the slide. So, yeah, let me just explain the, the criterion here. So along the bottom row, you'll see that it says zero up to seven. Those are the, there are seven different domains within mystical experiences on the SCQ. And the, the number here on the bars represents the number of people who scored 0.6 or higher on that many of the domains. So if you've scored 0.6 or higher in all seven domains, then you're in that right-hand purple bar. If you haven't scored any 0.6 or higher in any of the domains, you're in the z on the left-hand side. Does that make sense? So, okay, so, so that's what we have is that, that, that bimodal distribution, and we haven't done the correlational analysis yet. Uh, with the SOW scores, uh, before treatment and after treatment, uh, what we're showing is that out of a possible score of 64, with 64 being the, most, uh, the worst withdrawal symptoms, um, this is right before treatment, so they start going into withdrawal and then they're administered the ibogaine for the first time. Uh, and so that's when this first uh, bar is generated, and that's an average of all people who did the, who did the SOWs. And then post-treatment, uh, two or three days after, and you can see that the uh, mean has decreased quite a bit, and in fact it's so substantially decreased the p-value is 0 .0001, um, and just in case you're, you're not familiar with the p-value, what this means is that there is less than a 1 in 10,000 chance that these, the difference in these means was uh, brought on by chance alone. So it's a highly significant uh, difference. And um, after the detox, what happens to people? I was dismayed to, to see during the study that people were really at relapsing uh, over one-third within the first month post-treatment, 60% uh, within the first two months, and 87% uh, within the first six months out of a 12-month follow-up. So I, I found this a bit discouraging, but uh, I, d I needn't have been discouraged by this because I could see from the data looking more deeply that even people who were using again were using much less frequently and their dosage was much lower. And this is reflected in the ASI scores. And more importantly, as you'll see, the ASI scores are lower because people are, are much more satisfied with their lives. They don't experience as many problems with their drug use. They're, they're uh, in much better shape, in other words. So now I'm going to show you all those numbers I talked about. The, um, 
the, on the left side, you see the ASI, the seven different domains uh, of the ASI, the problem areas. And on the, up, on the upper uh, bars are the follow-up. There's baseline, month one, month three. So these are 30-day periods where we're getting the ASI data for each of the subjects in the, in the study. Um, and then the N is indicating how many people completed the follow-up that month. So we started with 30, and we went to 19 and 16. You'll see those numbers drop off as there's some attrition during the study. Um, but all of these comp are comparisons of baseline to month one and month three. Uh, and if you're more familiar with these kinds of things, uh, you'll you want to know that these are pairwise uh, t-test uh, evaluations. And so in each box, I've, I've made it intentionally too small to read because I want to focus on what the graph is showing right here. Uh, the, the purple numbers, which are going to be enlarged, are going to be the, the uh, ASI subscore, the mean ASI subscore in each in each time period, and the number in, uh, in the right-hand corner there is the p-value, that is the significance. And the lower that number is, the more strongly significant the differences in the means between baseline and follow-up are. So that said, we look at the first three uh, categories in the first few months after treatment, and you can see that um, medical status, actually the, the scores are getting higher on average, but not significantly so. Those are uh, 0 0.33, 0 0.63, and they're not considered significant. It's only when you get down to 0 0.05 or less that it's considered significant. And uh, employment and support actually increases significantly, so they're getting much worse scores on that in the first month follow-up. Um, and it's an easy thing to explain because, thank you, it's an easy thing to explain because after treatment, a lot of times people will either go into rehab or they're not working for one reason or another. They're they're working on recovery. Um, so, uh, but then with alcohol, you see the first two months in follow-up that the scores are not changing significantly. Things get really more interesting when we start talking about the drugs, as I'm sure that every, everyone here in attendance will agree. So those scores are dropping precipitously uh, from uh, baseline to month one, month three. And again, we have a one, less than one in 10,000 chance or probability that these are brought on by chance alone. Um, Legal status, also looking good. We have significant uh, decreases in uh, legal status. These are things like how much money you're making, earning uh, from selling, uh, from illegal uh, uh, activities, or uh, how worried are you about your legal status right now. Um, family and social, also very highly significant results. And these, I think, are really important for the Ibogaine uh, treatment, and these are indications that they are getting along much better with people that matter to them in their lives, um, and they're happier with their, with their social status and their, and, their, and their relationships. Psychiatric status, we have a tendency towards significance, but not quite significant here. It's almost down to 0 .5, 0 0.05, I'm sorry, but then we get up the 0 0.05 level of significance on the, on the three-month follow-up. So um, to, for simplicity, what I'm going to do here okay, is to uh, code these with colors. So anything that increases significantly is going to be in orange. If it increases for the point o or decreases the 0.05 level, it's in green, and the most significant decreases are in the blue there. Uh, so moving on, we have uh, the month six follow-up. So halfway through the follow-up period, and you'll see that uh, medical status, same story, it's not changing significantly. Uh, employment and support, uh, it's, it's coming back down towards baseline, uh, but not significantly different. Alcohol, same story. It's not changing significantly from baseline. Drugs, we're still getting this highly significant reduction in their ASI, sever their severity rating in the, in the drug section. Um, and um, legal status, again, uh, 0.05 significance. Uh, family and social, very highly significant differences from baseline to follow up. And in the psychiatric or psychological status, again, tending towards significance, but not quite significant. And I think we will see, eventually we'll, we can, we'll do the follow-up analysis for every follow-up month, so two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Um, right now, we're just looking at these strips, and when we add in the others, these ones that are tending towards significance, I think we're going to see are significant for those follow-up periods if we aggregate the data. So, um, okay, where are we? Psychiatric status. Um, I just covered that. Okay, so we're adding in the last two months of uh, the last two periods of follow-up that we uh, we've analyzed so far, and uh, month nine and month twelve. And what does this 
what does this story say? Um, for the top three categories, it's the same. It's continuing that these are not significant differences. Um, and uh, let's see, employment support, you actually see at month 12, it's, it's come down below baseline, but not significantly so. It's, that's good to see. Uh, with drugs, uh, again, all, all across the board, every follow-up we've been analyzed so far, 0 0.001, or the highest, I think it was 0 0.001, 0 0.001 significance. Uh, so, um, and then we go to uh, legal status, again, significant across the board. Uh, same with family and social and psychiatric status. Uh, it's again is significant at the very end, uh, and s most strongly so at month 12, which is promising. It's it's a, it's an encouraging uh, result. So this chart, I've removed the baseline column just to show you all the follow-up data on one on one uh, chart, and uh, so this really shows you what the trends are, and it's very, they're very strongly consistent trends, I think, especially in terms of the drug uh, severity rating. And um, legal status, family and social is also very strong, and psychiatric status. I'm, I'm frankly, that we just uh, worked up these numbers over the past couple of weeks. I'm frankly thrilled that we're getting these kinds of results, because I, like I said, during the study period, when I saw people relapsing and people who weren't calling me back, and you know, when I was trying to reach some for follow follow-ups, I thought, oh, this isn't going so well, but uh, I got to say these results look really good right now. So, um, so what we're looking at for further analysis is not only to do all the, the follow-up analyses for each month and aggregating the data, uh, but also we want to look at what are the determinants of long-term outcome for people. Um, and in specific, uh, we're looking for correlations between things like the states of consciousness questionnaire scores, the intensity of their experience, and whether that correlates with the changes in their ASI scores. And um, also uh, see if there's any effect on aftercare. I haven't mentioned aftercare, but this is, we're talking about what's often called integration, where after their treatment, they're given some kind of support. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, direct therapy. It could be Narcoholics Anonymous. Uh, uh, or any kind of uh, follow-up treatment or therapy to help them integrate the experiences they've had uh, during the Ibogaine treatment in the months afterwards. We don't have that many people in the study who received that kind of aftercare, but there are some, and we can do a comparative analysis of the people who've gotten aftercare versus the people who don't have aftercare. So I hope I've covered everything uh, well enough that you can understand what I'm saying. If not, please ask me questions. Um, and I want to especially thank the people on this list. And there's one person who I didn't list that I, I, really, I wished I would have listed. And that uh, person is Brendan Hanrahan. He's, I think he's here right now. And I want to thank him for helping with the slides last night. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I've got for you today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I may have missed this in the beginning, but did you describe your treatment? Did you describe your treatment protocol? Uh, no, I didn't, and that's because we don't we don't have a treatment protocol. It's a strictly observational study, so we're observing what happens with people uh, after treatment. So the treatment protocol is is the clinics the, the treatment protocol is the clinics protocol. So we're simply observing what happens with people from treatment. So it's. It, Uh, the treatment protocol varies from one person to the next and from one clinic to the next. So it's individual for person as the, as the clinician. Yeah. Um, it, it would probably be mostly speculation, but do you have any inclination as to why you were losing contact with some of the patients who were receiving treatment? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, my sense of it is that um, when people do relapse, well, first of all, people are busy as we know, and, and, but I think that when people relapse and they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it, so they don't, they don't want to hear from me calling them and saying, hey, you know, how are things going? So I think that the number, number one reason why people didn't respond in the follow-ups was they were disappointed. They thought that the, the treatment had failed because they'd relapsed, uh, and so they didn't, want to, they didn't want to follow up with me. 
Um, uh, I only want to ask, uh, if you start a study with uh, 30 participants and you lose 20 because of different reasons, I guess, yeah. uh, then you can't do statistics on the 10 left. So what, uh, how do you proceed with that and how do you sell that as science? Uh, the way that we handle that, so that did everyone hear the question? So, okay, so the, the question is how do we handle the loss of study participants and how do we analyze the data with that when we've lost so many people from the study? Um, that the way we do that is that the, all the comparisons are pairwise from baseline and only the people who are, who are doing those particular follow-ups, say the nine-month follow-up, are included in that statistical comparison. And even though, you know, say at month uh, six, I think we've got just nine people who, did, who completed the follow-up that month. That doesn't mean that there are only nine people left in the study, but that's how many people responded that particular month. Um, but even though we only had nine people in the study at that point, we're still getting significant results on the ASI scores. So um, that's what I really, I wasn't sure that that was going to happen. I was actually kind of thinking it wasn't going to happen during the study, but it turns out that the numbers are significant. Did that, that answer your question? Yeah, I'm wondering, um how your Ibogaine study compares to more traditional like AA or rehab, like how is the prognosis different? That's something we really haven't explored yet. Um, it's been really pretty much all consuming to do this study and um, also do my day job over the last couple of years. And so we really are just getting a look at the data now and um, then we'll start to compare it to what else is out there. Um, I don't know about these other clinics, but I know Claire has a, a good aftercare, and I, I was wondering if you had any comparisons to that follow-up treatment and um, more slowly reintegrating them and having them create new lives rather than going to their old habits and old crowd and the, you know, the, um, being influenced by your old lifestyle. Did you have any um, results comparing that Those that's that's an excellent care. yeah that's an excellent question um i we only had i think five people in the first month have any kind of aftercare whatsoever and i in some ways i view this as a sort of worst case scenario because for the most part what's happening is people are getting their ibogaine treatment and then they might be staying at the clinic for three four five days uh, at claire wilkins clinic they often stay longer but um uh, sometimes they're staying for as short as five days or so, and then they go back home. They're back in the old environment. Um, so worst case scenario, you just give them the Ibogaine and they go back home. Um, so even with that worst case scenario, we're getting these kinds of results. But I'd love to do that comparison, but we, don't, we might not have the numbers to compare. And it would be great to be able to have a study where we can have aftercare with one group of subjects, one group of participants, and compare those to people who don't have the aftercare. Thank you. Sure. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.